Hey there, good people in crypto land. I'm Matt Lysing, and this is my podcast, Decent People. Welcome back to the conversation. Today on the show, I spoke with Zaki Mannion, who, if you've been around any amount of time in blockchain, you know who Zaki is, or you might know him personally. He is the co-founder of Somalia. That's one of the most recent projects he is working on, but he's maybe better known for helping launch the Cosmos blockchain world. He was the director at the Tendermint Foundation, which is the software that runs on top of Cosmos. Cosmos is a is a blockchain where if you want your own specific blockchain for an application or for your protocol, that's where you go to build it rather than building on top of another public blockchain like Ethereum. We talked a lot about Cosmos, about some of the history, about how it's seen some better days, the low blow ups of last year, especially the Terra Luna stablecoin that, that failed. It was a tough one for the Cosmos ecosystem because Terra was built on Cosmos and there was a lot of a lot of connections to the DeFi world and the Cosmos chain related to Terra. Zaki gave his kind of comments on that and not just the bad stuff, but what was a kind of a silver lining to all of that. We also just talked about the general state of things in the crypto winter and what Zaki sees as some green shoots here coming out of this winter. So with all that out of the way, uh, let's get to the conversation. Thanks for being here. I hope you enjoy it. Hello there, Zaki. How's it going? It's going great, man. Thank you so much for being here. I'm excited to talk to you. Before we get into all the cool stuff that you've done with Cosmos and Tendermint and Somalia, I thought we could, there's a couple of things that are happening concurrently right now in the Web3 blockchain world that I I thought I'd love to hear your take on. And it's because I'm a little bit bummed about it, but I think a lot of people are excited. And so it's basically, there's a couple of things. PayPal has come out and said that they're going to release a stable coin. Yeah. And then Visa said recently that they're going to create a system where you can use a Visa card to pay for gas fees inside of, of a smart contract wallet. So... A lot of people are really excited about that. I get it. Like PayPal is a huge deal, but I'm also on the fence a little bit because one of the things I love about this space the most, I think, is its permissionlessness and the fact that you can just build stuff, put it out there either on on top of chain or you can build your own protocol, put it out into the world and nobody can stop you from doing it. When you think of like any other profession, you need a credential, you need a license, you need a degree, you need a certificate, you need something, right? To get permission to do stuff. But here, that's never been the case. And I feel like that's getting taken away a little bit if these centralized, huge payments companies are in the middle of a lot of these transactions. I just, PayPal, if you remember, if you buy crypto on PayPal, they don't give you the keys, right? So it's not even your crypto. And they have the ability to turn off the stable coin and to do things like that as, as a centralized authority. So I've been in this a while and it bums me out a little bit. And I was curious what, what your take is on that. So I think there's a couple of, I, I guess where my mind goes a little bit is I've, okay, so I'll just quickly of a brain dump a couple of different aspects yeah, of the sure, thesis go for it. to me. Okay. I think the big, so let's talk about a couple of things. One is, okay, so I've been in blockchains for a long time. What I think about is like basically prior to summer 2020, we had like, probably a couple of hundred on-chain users. It was really that bad. We had this like very tiny on-chain user base. And what we, and so we had this tiny on-chain user base and it was when it was, you were building blockchain protocols, you were building them in this kind of vacuum where you hypothesized future user behavior and future user needs while building things like Cosmos and Tendermint and Ethereum and so on. It was all very hypothetical because we had very little real user It was basically a lot of stories of when the users come, it will be like this. And in that era, we talked, there was a lot more philosophical talk about the trade-offs between permissionless systems and permission systems. And it was all very, but it was all very hypothetical. And then starting in 2020 and then through the pandemic, and even today, we are, we are seeing there, there do seem to be perhaps hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of on-chain users. And what you're seeing what from large brands like Coinbase, Visa, PayPal, and large pieces of, of financial infrastructure is they foresee a future where there might be 
tens, hundreds of millions of on-chain users. And bringing tens of millions of users on-chain, because if all we ever accomplish in blockchains is people trading and speculating on assets on centralized exchanges, we have accomplished nothing and all of this has been pointless. So the that would be my, okay, so that's like top level thing. But I think the other thing that like, that like some of us hypothesized and has really played out so far is that the user experience from this generation of blockchain technology on chain has been terrible. We have the, we anticipated the prevalence of bridge hacks when we started working on IBC and that turned out to be true. We thought that the MEV being a real concern and now end users of blockchains have lost hundreds of millions of dollars to MEV in the last, now in the, in this sort of like early on-chain phase. Yeah. Can we just, uh, let's just jump in there. MEV is maximum extracted value. And it's when validators can reorganize the transactions in a block to benefit themselves, yeah, but basically. Maybe we can make it a little bit more, we can make it a little bit more specific than that. You as a, you're, you're an end blockchain user. You've gotten really excited about the latest meme coin, Pepe. It tri- you go to Unis- the Uniswap front end and place an order. And embedded in that order, uh, not super obvious, is this notion of slippage. Okay, And what slippage really is, is the worst price you're willing to pay for an asset, i.e., I'm willing to get a 1% or a 2% worse price than the price that I see on my screen. And what, and this is a, this concept of introducing slippage comes from the fact that there's a latency between like inherently there's like, I sign my, I like sign my transaction. And by the time my transaction gets included in the blockchain, several blocks will have passed and the price will have changed because other people have traded. So in order to get my transaction in, I have to create uh, but if there is any gap, you give gap, a range, right? You give a range yeah. of what prices you're willing to take. Any gap between that range and the moment my transaction is about to be put into a block, um, these pe- searchers who are these MEV extractors will come in and make sure that gap gets pushed to the edge. So you will essentially you've you've given a range of prices, but you'll as a user on chain, you'll always get the worst one, right? Yeah, and that is and like. On-chain users, what are most on-chain users doing today? The biggest on-chain user thing is is trading on Uniswap and, and it's mostly trading meme coins on Uniswap, trading assets that like primarily trade on-chain rather than on centralized exchanges. Yeah. So retail traders get fucked, basically. Yeah. Uh, and so yeah. let's get but let's get back to okay, but you think so, like, so this, centralization. I, I gotta is like good tell this to, whole story because it, yeah. <laughs> we got we have to like set the framework in which things like PayPal and Visa coming on chain, Okay. what it means, okay? And so I think like one of the big changes is, so I view all of this stuff in the lens of a lot of like very centralized stuff is launching right now. Uh, Base launched with a, with a centralized sequencer and no fraud proofs, and that might be the a huge onboarding thing. Yeah, that's um, the layer two from Coinbase. That's the layer two from Coinbase. You have, I'll be better at providing context. Uniswap launched a new system called Uniswap X, which is an off-chain order book that has the potential to say, to help save those, protect those retail traders who are trading on Uniswap, but introduces a layer of centralization. You, you have Visa potentially abstracting over gas fees so that people... Visa, on one hand, Visa and PayPal's massive user bases are never going to come on chain if the on chain experience is, is, is so it is poor today. and people are losing hundreds of millions of dollars to intermediaries and other actor and, and adversarial actors on chain. We're introducing these layers of permissioning, we're introducing these layers of centralization. There's a potential for better user experience. The permissionless layer moves more slowly, is is also trying to innovate in terms of solving these problems. And you have this like s- sort of tension that exists with it. I think that the that to me, the future of blockchains is all is very much going to be about airlocks and gateways between the permissioned world and the permissionless world. That the future can well, is very unlikely to uh, any future in which billions of people use blockchains is unlikely to be 
fully permissionless. It's more likely that there's going to be this, there's going to be layers that are permissionless and there are going to be permission and there's going to be layers that are permissionless in their, in the majority of user interactions and opportunities. And many things will be a blend of both permissioned and permissionless interaction. I think that's just generally reality. I do like that there, I think the best thing that is happening in blockchain is there are so many builders and researchers who are built trying to build, who are trying to build aligned permissionless solutions to a lot of these challenges. So yeah, so on one hand, like you have Visa talking about gas payments and stuff like that via your Visa card. On the other hand, you have the Gnosis Pay team, which has launched this amazing infrastructure, which allows you to use a self-custodial wallet from at a payment terminal. And in an ideal world, we have both. Yeah, because I'm I'm with you on that, and that's why I'm on the fence. Is that I think these huge corporations are going to be needed to shepherd a lot of people into the space because certainly after FTX and, and a lot of things, I think retail just got super burned here and they're not going to, they're going to want somebody to hold their hand. And I think that's where a PayPal or a Visa could be good, but it also just takes away, I think, from some of the cool original ethos around the whole thing. But again, like you said, it's not an either or, I think with account abstraction wallets, there's probably a lot of stuff we don't know yet that you could do in there to not necessitate having a visa card as part of your transactions. Hopefully time will tell. And uh, I'd love to jump in to, as any listener can tell, you've got a deep knowledge here, but you, you always didn't do that or have that. Let's go back to where did you grow up and how did you make your way in, into blockchain? Yeah. Okay. So my story is I grew up in the Silicon Valley. My parents are entrepreneurs. So all in many ways, a lot of this is very familiar. I used to do biotech. I used to do all, build medical instrumentation but do and build all kinds of different things in biotech. I spent about eight years in biotech after college. So I went to college at UPenn. I did history of science, which is not really relevant to anything, but it made me really good at learning new fields. Then I... So I did biotech for a while and I got real bored because biotech moves extremely slowly as I got towards the end of it. And I was looking for something that was moving faster. And so I was exploring the like various meetup scenes that were in the Bay Area at the time. And I got real interested in the cryptography, security and privacy sort of ecosystem that existed in the Bay Area. I, I felt like there was a lot of commonality of values and viewpoints between me and them. And so I dove into their, so I dove into that world. I was really interested in things and what like year, war and signal. What year are we talking about? Huh? This what is year? 2013. 2013. Okay. Yeah. And so I've been, so I graduated from college in 2005. I did biotech until basically 2012, 2013. I started to look for something else. I started going to meetups in 2012 and 2013 got pulled into the security and privacy scene, met a lot of the people who I currently work with in blockchains and cryptocurrencies, then got started an enterprise blockchain company called SkewChain in 2014, started contributing to things like Tendermint and uh, Zcash and stuff like that. Uh, got really fascinated by zero knowledge proofs, wanted to learn how all the cryptography worked, generally wanted to learn how all of the cryptography worked. So I spent a lot of time learning cryptography and distributed systems. I was like, I didn't really understand what problem public blockchains were solving. I thought they were like interesting technical constructs. I didn't really understand the business problem they were solving until maybe like 2016, 2017. At that point, realized that the future was going to be public chains and that that was the thing that I wanted to focus on. So left SKU chain, start just focused on all the public chains. In like 2015, 2016, I was also sort of part of this community of people who pretty much all ended up building L1s, Jay Kwan, Dominic Williams, Martin Kopelman, uh, uh, Arthur Brightman. Everyone was, all of these people like lived in the Bay Area at the time. So it was really convenient. We would get together on Saturdays. We would hang out. We would talk about technical ideas and, and blockchain designs and stuff like that. 2017, obviously this massive amount of capital flew, flowed into everybody's different projects. 
spent a lot of time helping people with, those, with their various problems. 2018 decided to focus on shipping Cosmos. So like manage the whole Cosmos launch. 20, after that happened, 2019, so 2019 Cosmos launches, doing IBC took a lot longer than expected. So 2019 and 2020, uh, uh, we were was basically finishing up IBC. 2021 IBC launches, 2021 we launched some, we start some LEA. And yeah, that's been my journey. I've had a lot of ideas and influence over the whole design, proof of stake, on-chain governance, interoperability, still know a lot of cryptography. And yeah, and I would say that I would say I continue to believe that like the thing that I am most, you talk about this ethos of permissionlessness and it's like the like place where permissionless makes the biggest difference is like financialization and DeFi. It doesn't mean that just financialization can only apply to very traditional finance concepts. I also think like NFT Fi, Game Fi, the financialization of culture, the financialization of gaming are also going to be important aspects of all of this stuff. But yeah, DeFi and like its cousins are like the thing that really interests me. And it sounds like cryptography was your way in. Is that yeah. fair to say? And and what was it about cryptography that kind of grabbed you? I like the map. It's probably or I liked I don't know. It, it's hard to really res, to like to reverse engineer. At the time, I was just like, I think this is a really interesting, intellectually interesting domain. How math, like how this field of math underlies so much like human coordination, security, privacy. Con- there's this very human. There's this r- relationship between cryptography and of like somewhat er- es- esoteric math and very human things like privacy, intellectual freedom, coordination, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, like basic human rights. So there's, it's a very odd thing that there's this field of math that connects so heavily to these really fundamental human things. Mm -hmm. And so it's been really, it was really, it, that really sucked me into wanting to learn a lot about it. I do very little cryptography these days. I do mostly businessy stuff and like higher level protocol work. But the, a lot of that knowledge is still in my head. And I, I like I like following all of the developments in, in zero knowledge proof protocols and stuff like that. Yeah, it's, it sounds to me like if you could do it over, maybe you'd go back and be a computer science major in undergrad and not history. I went to Penn and at the time their computer science, like I tried computer science and their computer science yeah. department was just awful. Uh-huh. Um, and yeah, my skill is generally that if I did want to learn any subject, I can just learn it. It's cool. Yeah. Not many people can say that. Was it Ethereum going live that kind of convinced you about public chains versus what you've been doing with SkewCoin or uh, with Skew chain? No, it wasn't. I, I was, I gotta say I was an Ethereum skeptic. I was an Ethereum contributor in many ways. And I've been friends with Vitalik for a long time and I liked a lot of the people, but the initial technical architecture seemed incredibly flawed to me. And it's been honestly extraordinary watching all of those flaws mostly get resolved over the course of the last couple of years, especially this last year. I thought MEV was going to be fatal to Ethereum. I thought I was extremely skeptical that the proof of stake transition would ever happen. I think this re-architecting of Ethereum into this sort of roll-up centric vision, which makes it a lot more like Cosmos, I think is directionally correct. And so I've been generally really proud of what Ethereum has accomplished. But in the beginning, Ethereum actually seemed extremely bearish for me on the future of public chains. But I felt like, but what I realized is that like the utility of a public blockchain and of public blockchains in general to humanity is so high that it's likely that there's going to be enough desire for these things to overcome all of their early flaws. It's a little wild too, because as you're talking about that and and you know the history better than anyone about all the different L1 blockchains that were out there. And now everything seems to be accruing to Ethereum and think people are changing L1s into layer twos so that they can get the security and other benefits of the Ethereum chain, but be faster or be more specialized in 
having covered Ethereum for a long time, how many Ethereum killers have come and gone, but yet it seems like it, by hook or by crook, Ethereum just starts to gain more mass or, or more sort of weight in the space, which is, I, I think, a bit unexpected, like you said, I, I think. Uh, I, I think I spend a lot of, I feel like I, I have a very detailed understanding of why this is from building in Cosmos, from building Sommelier, which is very, uses Cosmos tech, but is very Ethereum focused in its uh, products. It's the primary interface for its like sort of the protocols is from the Ethereum chain. What I would basically say is the thing that Ethereum has been able to do uniquely is bring on board various types of risk capital that have basically the Ethereum ICO appealed to a lot of very risk tolerant people. And then those people have made a lot of money. And then those people have been happy to deploy that money, taking on additional risk in many cases. And Ethereum uniquely has, has that population of committed, aligned risk capital that very few, essentially no, especially in the sort of post, especially in this bear market, basically no other blockchain ecosystem has that. I think on the other hand, we are, I, I would say I'm, I've been trying to change that about Cosmos for the last maybe six or seven months. And as, and like, it's going okay. But I think like one of the biggest challenges that all of the other ETH killer ecosystems have is largely they didn't, they raise at large valuations, they don't have risk capital onboarded that they like did thousand X returns from who are then willing to go and like speculate and take risk with one or 10% of that, of those massive returns. Instead, you have a population that is very much professional investors, mercenary retail speculators who aren't as willing to just roll a hundred million dollars into a semi-functional base bridge and go and go seed an ecosystem. Yeah. It's a tough challenge to overcome for Yeah, and that's, that's really over. interesting about how you characterize it as the people who are there at the beginning and the risk takers and their tolerance. I hadn't thought about it like that in the in personal terms. But maybe this is a good time to just talk about Cosmos and why how it differs from Ethereum and what you guys were hoping to achieve and what you did achieve by creating this different uh, model for kind of a base layer and then the, the things that you can build on top of a blockchain? Yeah, I think people, especially people who showed up into blockchains in this last bull run, actually don't really remember what blockchains looked like in 2017 and 2018. In 2017, 2018, there were no bridges. The only way of moving between blockchains was centralized exchanges. The there were most of the blockchains that were out there were proof of work chains. Most of the blockchains were forks of Bitcoin. Ethereum existed. Ethereum had Ethereum was subject to very high gas prices. Things were very the user experience on top of Ethereum was pretty poor. There were a lot of hacks. There were a lot of this was the world. And Cosmos wanted to do a couple of things. One is we wanted to show that a very rigorously designed proof of stake system that enabled high throughput blockchains, high throughput was possible and could be done in a way that still felt permissionless and decentralized. Because what everyone had hypothesized before was that proof of stake networks with validator sets, it would walk in uh, some set of initial network participants and they would just run the network forever. And we focused really hard on this like very unique decentralized launch of the Cosmos chain, hub chain on really demonstrating that BFT protocols that until then had only existed in acad sort of academic environments could actually run in the same sort of open internet way that they had. So that was like that. And then the other piece that we've, and we have always been our core of our thesis, that there would be that there was going to be two things. One is that there was this desire for sovereignty, that people, projects, communities would, design, would, be, would desire to sort of own their own blockchain where they could set their own consensus rules, where they could make their own things. 
And then this longer term thesis around what we call app chains, which is the Ethereum was the, pri the primary example of a general purpose blockchain. Now you have all these high scale general purpose blockchains like Aptos and Sui and Solana all exist. But like this idea of a general purpose blockchain was a big, it was like this idea, we had this counter idea, which was the final form of many blockchain projects and ideas would be like, like blockchain products would be an app chain where the protocol could control everything, could control block production, could control validator section, could control the transaction inclusion policy, could control what, how, and when, and where gas fees were charged, everything. Uh, and they've all been very long bets to play out. The success of Cosmos's proof of stake work, I think, translated into rapid adoption across many different chains and was an influence on things like Ethereum proof of stake launching. And then the, the app chain thesis, I still think is basically in incredibly in its infancy. I am, I've honestly been shocked at how long it has taken like apps to really become popular on blockchains. I think there, we are still just like in the earliest stage of any applications at all really existing on blockchain. So what's, to make it concrete, what's an example of something you think or you would have thought would as an application be more prevalent in blockchain right now? I would have thought that financialized social media apps, financialized gaming, like all of the things people are talking about is potentially like the next wave of stuff would actually have been further along. But like one of the other things that's always unpredictable about one of the other things that's like very true about blockchains is that bull markets are just incredibly distracting. Like when we go into these like speculative frenzies that happen in blockchain and whenever we get into these like speculative frenzy, it distracts all the builders, it distracts all the communities. Nobody knows where to focus their effort. And when resources become more constrained, everybody has to pick a few bets and play those out. And so this, oh, like we build in the bear market thing, there's a lot of truth to it. I've been, this is, this is my third market cycle. And yes, it is incredibly focusing to, it is much, much easier to focus and it is much less tempting. The nature of bull markets is you want to, you're going to play, you're going to, you do try to like you do tend to go wide. You're like, oh, I'm going to try this, and I'm going to try this, and I'm going to try this. And I, you can say the same thing about me. Is during the 2021 bull market, I was probably, I'm still working on like too many projects, but <laughs> at the time it was just like, okay, we're just going to try and make, do everything at the same time. And we're going to try and make a bunch of different parallel bets, even with inside Sommelier. Whereas right now, Sommelier, we've like really been focused on like the, Ethereum liquid staking market because there just there aren't also as many things that like seem compelling. Like it is just an incredible. It is it drives a lot of focus during the bear markets. Yeah, the the bull market's like a shark when it attacks and its eyes get rolled over and you just yeah. can't see anything. You're just in a frenzy. Um, so l let's just finish out with Cosmos because I mean it's had better days. I guess is one way to put it. it it's uh, so. Okay, I'll give you. I'll I'll, I'll say there's two thesis, two things that are true here. Okay. I was interviewed for this Coindesk article about sort of Cosmos having 12 months to figure itself yeah, out. Sam Kessler it. wrote that. It was quite, yeah. quite an in-depth piece. Yeah. And that represents, in, to some extent, one part of my thesis, which is Cosmos needs a sense of urgency because the basically every other blockchain ecosystem has built their version of Cosmos already or is building their version of Cosmos. When, like, we had the we had this huge advantage in Cosmos in the sort of, from like 2019 until 2023, the last four years, which is if you wanted your own app chain, you wanted bridging built in, you wanted control, you wanted to experiment with things like custom protocols, you didn't, you wanted, you, you had all the, we were basically the only game in town you had to use like all of the popular blockchains used some or all of our technology. You had Matic and Polygon who were using some of our who were using our technology. Binance, BNB chain, and BSC. 
You had Kronos the, and Crypto.com and their chain ecosystem. So you just had these like very large, million large scale ecosystems, and they had one option. Now you have a lot of options. You have all of the different L2 stacks, ZK, Optimistic, you have rollups on other chains. Everything is becoming more and more like Cosmos. So that's the, that's to me though, Cosmos has been seeing better days thing because, and that, right, is people are like, okay, should I just bet somewhere else? Like optimism and the OP token is basically a meme query for the optimism stack in the same way that like Adam is the meme coin for the Cosmos SDK and its stack. Arbitrum is the meme coin for the Arbitrum stack. Why don't I just, I can parallel best across all of these things. And that is all true. On the other hand, we are seeing the first sets of applications launching right now that uniquely need the Cosmos stack. The unique needs of the Cosmos, DYDX is like the perfect example of what the ideal Cosmos user would look like. And when that goes live and like they're in testnet right now, and I've been, I've been working with the DYDX team about their For Cosmos. For people who don't blog. know, I'll just give a word. What is DYDX? Absolutely. Thanks. Yeah. DYDX is the leading. So there is a, a type of trading instrument that has been, has long been, has been very popular in blockchains called a perpetual option or a, a perpetual. And it's basically a way of taking a leveraged bet on vol on like price movement of an asset. You wake up, you, you think. And you think Bitcoin is going to go up or you think Bitcoin is going down, you can pace, place a bet as a financial instrument on like the movement of Bitcoin price versus, and you can do so with a substantial amount of leverage. If Bitcoin, you might put up $500 into the trade, but you could be trading a Bitcoin position that is essentially like $5,000 or $15,000 or more. And these, this sort of leverage trade, it, it is both useful. You have these highly volatile assets. It's fun. So it is both useful for hedging against if you're a professional market maker and you're participating in both like the crypto asset market, even the stock market, having these perpetuals is like a really useful instrument for various types of trading strategies. It's also basically a very fun sort of gambling like instrument for retail. It's been very popular and DYDX has DYDX has been very successful in, cre in creating a decentralized alternative to... So these markets have primarily been on centralized exchanges for the last 10 years. And now these perpetual markets are... is Like the biggest perpetual market for this is DYDX, which is today an Ethereum L2 running on Starkware's technology, but has a centralized order book. And they are using Cosmos to build the next version of their technology stack which is decentralizing many of the centralized components, including the order book using the Cosmos technology stack. Yeah. And what's cool about the perpetual derivatives is like a, a typical derivative, a, a traditional one, it has a period and then it, it, it what's it called? It settles. And then you have to get a new contract, but there's more trading fees involved. But with a perpetual, I believe it just rolls and rolls, right? Until you close it. Yep. Yeah. So I know this isn't probably, I don't know if this is necessarily fair, but Terra was built w with Cosmos technology. Do you think that had an unfair effect when Terra collapsed and, and that co sort of hit the, the Cosmos Defo DeFi kind of ecosystem? Yeah. So here's, here are things that I think are the, the effects of, the t of Terra, right? So Terra was this blockchain built with the Cosmos SDK. They started building with the Cosmos SDK in 2019. They decided to really focus on DeFi as a use case for, so they had always started with this stable coin. Cosmos enabled them to build a kind of stable coin that you could not have built on an Ethereum, for instance, and certainly would not have gotten as big on Ethereum. So this is like one of the, this is like the, the dual sides of this stuff, I feel as someone who's been building in this space is, co Ethereum, for one of the things that was an effect of Ethereum, is it like, the limitations of throughput and gas prices and all of the challenges of using the software also acted as like a self-limiting factor on the size of experimental financial structures that could be built on top of it as well. Whereas 
building with the Cosmos stack really allowed Terra to run the experiment at enormous scale. And it collapsed it as it, with the token being worth about $40 billion and north of $20 billion of the stable coin. And essentially all of that went to zero, yeah. which was this massive devastating effect. The other thing is this interoperability protocol. That, so, the, so a lot of the technologies that Cosmos had built, effectively Terra was the primary user. So people who, oh, there was people very quickly realized that the easiest and cheapest way to access a product called Anchor on Terra, which was paying 20% returns in their stablecoin and other projects on the Terra blockchain, was frequently to buy atoms, which were listed on many exchanges, go through a project called Osmosis, which is the primary decentralized exchange in Cosmos, and then enter into the Terra ecosystem. And there were hundreds of millions of dollars of Terra assets on Osmosis. There were billions of dollars a month of financial flows into and out of the Terra ecosystem through the Cosmos tech stack, the vast and overwhelming majority of builders. So about a little over a year ago, Terra collapses. I was in there in this chat room working with their validators. The thing was in a death spiral. Economic security was collapsing. We turned off the staking mechanism. It was a whole mess. I and so we're a year past that. Liquidity in the Cosmos ecosystem has been terrible. Most of a lot of basically everyone in the Cosmos ecosystem has been wrecked to one extent or another by the decline in sometimes spectacularly, maybe a little less with Adam. If you've just been sitting there staking Adam and holding Adam, a lot of Cosmos to ecosystem coins are down 95, 99% from, from last year. And so things are things that's a bit of darkness. Yeah. The flip side, I would say, is we have a bunch of projects that have launched who came out of the Terra ecosystem that are launching right now or have, have launched in the last year that seem to be doing incredibly well and bringing a lot of energy to the ecosystem. Like my favorite, a bunch of things that are like my favorite projects that have launched recently in Cosmos. So we have a, another perpetuals exchange called Lavana. And Lavana was incubated in the Terra ecosystem and recently launched on top of Osmosis and another Cosmos blockchain called Say. And Lavana is like one of the most fun apps I've ever used in blockchains, period. Absolutely love it. I'm not an investor, but I really like the product. And I think it is like an enormous demonstration of building something. There's this automated trading system called Calculated Finance that is also on top of Osmosis. There's this team called Kujira, which has built a DEX product that's or a, a set of DeFi products that are turning out to be incredibly popular with a lot of people. And so we've onboarded this great cohort of builder. People were often asking the question, okay, so how much, once Terra collapses, how many of these builders are going to stick around in Cosmos? And what is that going to look like? The reality is I think a lot of the best builders from the Terra ecosystem actually did stick around in Cosmos. They're, it's taken them about a year to find their footing in the, in the sort of post-Terra Cosmos ecosystem, launch all their systems and products again. And I think a bunch of them are incredibly exciting. But now we have the challenge, which is their user base is like the survivors of the Terra collapse. They're all very conservative. They're all very shell-shocked. They're like the opposite of that Ethereum innovation capital. Mm -hmm. And the question is, can we activate them? But Lavana trading volumes have been going up quite a bit in the last month. Their user numbers are growing. And so I do think that there's a lot of green shoots in the Cosmos ecosystem. There's a lot of stuff that's launching within the next few months that really demonstrates unique things that you can build in the Cosmos ecosystem that you can't build in all of these other L2 ecosystems, which will showcase to users why they should come and experiment and venture out outside of the EVM ecosystems and like the sort of ETHL2 ecosystems. And hopefully we can attract a, a new user base built on sounder economics than Terra, but using the same, using like basically improved versions of the technology that was so powerful for Terra. That's really well said. So let's talk about sommelier. You, you describe it as a decentralized asset manager. Like it puts me in mind of the BlackRock of the blockchain. But you're also, you mentioned earlier, 
that it's using Cosmos technology, but it's very much pointed towards the Ethereum world. Can you tell me about that and, and why? And then I've got some other questions about the decentralized nature of it and, and what like, it, it sounds a lot like it's about access, right? Okay. I guess the first question is, why do you need a decentralized asset manager, period? Isn't the entire point of blockchains to be your own bank? And I think so what we I think what we can learn from the last market cycle is people real like the majority of capital that came into DeFi actually came in through centralized entities. The Celsiuses of the world, the BlockFi's of the world took retail capital in a web two system and then deployed it into DeFi. And like all of that essentially rugged their users. There was incredibly poor risk management. The systems were incredibly opaque. There was fraud. So when I started building Sommelier, my idea, my point was, I was pretty sure I could use Cosmos tech to build a system that had a meaningful set of checks and balances and a meaningful way of enforcing transparency such that you could deliver what people wanted from the CDFI user experience, which is, hey, I want to interact with these DeFi protocols. I want the returns from DeFi. I want the transparency, but I don't, I can't, I don't want to wake up every morning or I don't want to spend hours every day, like adjusting my portfolio, tweaking my positions, rebalancing, adjust monitoring risk. I don't want to be on pager duty because of some market event has happened. Mm -hmm. And the point of sommelier was, hey, let's build a technology stack that is actually decentralized. So it's not just a glorified multi-sig. It's not an... It's not the an on-chain, it's not it's not just an on-chain BlackRock. It's actually something that never could exist in like the pre-blockchain financial world. How do you build that? Can you build that? And then can you can it deliver outsized returns? And what we've seen with this successful growth of, of Sommelier, which is we've gone from like a million TVL to 25 plus, I guess 27 million TVL in the last in since the beginning of the year. We've been successfully growing this in the in, in the bear market. And not only that, we've been through multiple turmoil events, whether it's the USDC DPEG, we had our, our stablecoin product, Real Yield USD, live during that. And we were able to manage that risk. Recently, we've had the curve hack and the ripple effects of the curve hack through the lending protocols, of which, you know, sommelier products are interacting with things with Fra Fraxland and Aave, all of which were affected by that situation. And with Sommelier was able to, the, the protocol was able to act to mitigate those risks in under 24 hours. So rather than you as a user being like, oh, what does this mean? How am I exposed? What am I doing? The protocol just takes care of all of that. So that's the dream. The dream is, and so I guess the reason why we built on Ethereum, Sommelier is really optimized for a world of real financial value creation and real transaction flows. We need trading volumes. We need blending and borrowing markets. We need composability. And all of that stuff is happening in Cosmos and it's becoming closer and closer to the day we're building something. We're sommelier building products for Cosmos starts to make sense. But in the past, for the last, especially the last two years, Ethereum DeFi has been a lot more mature. It's been a lot more of a fixed target to build against. It's been a lot more, it's just like a lot more mature and stable. And the there are even in the bear market, large stable coin and liquid staking and other cash flows that Sommelier can build on top of. And one thing you're advertising this as is, is it's like you say, combining off-chain compute power that traditional financial institutions like asset managers use, but it's private and it's proprietary and it's, they have machine learning and they have AI and they have all this, all this really powerful computing that they employ to create their models and test their models. But of, of course you need to either be a client of that firm or it's, they're doing it for themselves and they're not shouting this at the rooftop. And, but you guys are saying, you want to you you want to emulate that system, but bring it on chain and make it transparent. Is, do I have that right? So, if you put okay, so what we wanted to do is strike a balance. We believe that without both off chain compute and proprietary models, you cannot compute uh, a fully transparent on chain system. You need alpha and confidentiality to succeed in DeFi. Or, and in finance in general. But in the 
in the world of a traditional asset manager, you like basically hand your money over to that asset manager. You hope does what they say. You hope they don't steal from you. You hope they invest in the things that they said they were going to invest in and don't uh, put it all, bet it all on Luna or UST or whatever. You want, you hope that these things are true and regulators must exist and courts must exist to enforce people if they lie about these things, to prevent lies from happening, to license people who participate in these systems. What if you could build us, and like what Sommelier is instead a demonstration of a system where a lot of those checks and balances are worked into a protocol. On the smart contract layer of the system, we re regulate what DeFi protocols and what assets uh, a strategy can hold. Real yield USD or real yield ETH aren't going to add new liquid staking tokens or new stable coins without governance votes and a sort of extensive public process that's going to make it very clear to anyone who's holding assets in these systems you know, that their risk exposure is changing. The system is designed to allow anyone to add or deposit or withdraw money at any time. You can always check the smart contracts on DBank, see exactly what positions they're in, so you know what the system is doing for it. But how the off-chain strategist picks the asset balance, what DeFi protocols we're using, what ticks we're selecting, any other parameters in the DeFi protocol, how, like the models, those are all proprietary to the strategist and gives them the ability to have a meaningful edge that someone can't just come around and copy. Yeah, um, that's your secret sauce, of course. That being said, can you give any indication of what, where you guys are seeing alpha right now and where somebody can get edge? Yeah, we could, when, one of the things that I think people struggle, sometimes investors struggle with is the difference between their sort of theoretical vision of efficient markets in crypto and the practical reality of how inefficient the markets are today and the amount of value that a system like Sommelier can extract from markets today. And like my belief that markets will tend to contain large inefficiencies into the future on a relatively long time horizon. So it is actually astonishing. It continues to be pretty astonishing to me how, like, for how inefficient the stablecoin market is, how much opportunity, how, like, how slowly and ineffectively capital moves around, how frequently stablecoins are mispriced in de decentralized exchanges. We are on the USDC, USDT market. Sommelier's a seller is like one of the most profitable, is like, in the top five most profitable LPs, and every other LP that's in the top five is like a centralized system, and we are a decentralized system, and yet this opportunity exists. Mm -hmm. The same thing is true about the liquid staking. Also, just incredibly huge amounts of inefficiency, huge amounts of price volatility, a lack of sophisticated market makers. Almost anything where price discovery or volumes are large on chain today, there's just a lack of sophisticated capital that is providing an effective counterparty. And so as, as we say, I believe the numbers that we've, we've released so far is that like sommelier liquidity on, in, real, in our ETH liquidity has been a counterparty for $500 million of liquid staking trades. And like we've earned over 40 ETH from that process. And that, that opportunity scales pretty nicely. Like we could absorb a lot, significantly more capital into that. The like leveraged, like the delta between what you could be earning on your ETH liquid staking tokens, either through leverage or market making or various other protocols, and what you can borrow ETH at on lending protocols is also a huge delta, which has been, which is powering a lot of sommelier strategies. The, and this has been, I think a huge factor in creating like large opportunities for Somalia. Yeah, cool. Thank you for that. It's really interesting. So lastly, you've been through cycles, many cycles. This is your third. How do you feel about this one in terms of comparing it to the past winter cycle? And are there things that you're looking out for that will tell you that things are starting to turn around and are you seeing them yet? Yeah, I'll say a couple of things. One is, as you, we mentioned, we start out with PayPal and Visa, and there's a lot of stuff that hasn't been, that isn't public, that is under NDA from various parties, that where institutional infrastructure 
participation has not pulled back in any way, shape, or form compared to earlier market cycles. In earlier market cycles, institutions that stayed either went only enterprise chains or went only into research mode. Instead, like there are large institution, like teams at, at institutional players who are building stuff. What has been the biggest source of pullback has been how, how risk off capital has become and especially on-chain capital has become, but like generally, like market makers have pulled back enormously. The, like everyone who's, who used to be doing things on-chain has basically stopped in, on the institutional side. Like it's basically like on-chain institutional capital is almost entirely like a network of a small number of Singapore-based family offices that are like family offices of wealthy crypto people that are doing on-chain stuff. And it's really, it's really t- like the market has tightened and the number of players in the market has tightened enormously. That happened before. I think the difference is there's actually a lot more like the delta between on-chain volumes and on-chain users at the like end user retail level and the like people who are willing to be market participants, counterparties, long-term engaged capital has like really blown up in the same, whereas in the past, like basically what would happen is like all of the on-chain capital would disappear, but also all of the counterparties. Now it's like the counterparties have disappeared, but the on-chain capital is still, like on-chain users are actually still there in to a much greater degree, which I think is both a good and a bad thing. It's mostly a bad thing. It's, it would be, it's, it is going to be a struggle. And I think the other, the other thing that I think is the big challenge, I think, And another interesting sort of cultural thing is that FTX was a much larger psychological shock to U.S. capital allocators than it was to Middle Eastern and Asian capital allocators. Mm -hmm. And as a result, I think it's like a lot, it's had like a very different effect in like the way the North American market works, which is, has been a pullback to like only early seed stage stuff. What do you think um, accounts for that? Why was the U.S. shocked more than Asian or Middle Eastern investors? I think on one, I think it's two things. I think it's Asian investors are, Asian and Middle Eastern investors are frankly more used to large scale frauds. They happen much more frequently in the TradFi markets of those in Asia, in the Middle East. And so they're like, and there was less of a, and so and there's like an inverse thing where even though Alameda was like a Hong Kong based entity and then it became a Bahamas based entity and FTX was a Hong Kong based entity that became a Bahamas based entity, culturally, they were still very U.S. focused mm-hmm. and then became even more U.S. focused with naming sports arenas and, and very much becoming. And so FTX became the face of crypto to U.S. institutional players. Whereas in Asia, institutional players, Asian and Middle Eastern institutional players were never really uh, that heavily catered to, never felt a strong cultural connection. So it was just like a less of a psychological shock watching Mm -hmm. when FTX turned out to have been conducting this sort of large scale deception. And I think that's just another factor in this whole system. I also think on the regulatory side, Europe like Asia and Europe are moving very are are moving in a very positive direction. There's a lot of challenges for DeFi and stable coins, but a lot of things in crypto have effectively become legalized and regulated and on a firm regulatory footing in the EU that can enable things like Gnosis Pay to exist and fit into the existing banking system. And Asia is also moving in that direction, whereas the U.S. is just like at a log jam and in, in, in like endless litigation right now. Yeah, yeah. It's a very frustrating moment here in the U.S. for that. Lackey, thank you so much, man, for all of your knowledge and insight and your, the history that you know. It's been fascinating. For folks who want to know more about you or Somalier, to tell them how they can find out more about this stuff. So follow me on Twitter, Zmanian, Z-M-A-N-I-N on Twitter, Psalm Finance on Twitter, all good, pl- or x.com, I guess now, all good places to, to follow up. Yeah, great. And best of luck with Somalia. It sounds like you guys are having some great growth in this bear market. It'd be fascinating to see what you guys can do if the bull market comes back around. Uh, it will come back around. I'm yeah, confident. when it comes back around, when you should say. Around. Yeah. 
All right. Well, again, Zachy, thank you very much. Really appreciate your time. Thanks. That's it for this episode. Thanks for joining us. And don't forget to rate and follow this show on Apple, Spotify, and Amazon Music. Decent People is a production of Decentral Media. It is produced by Matt Bogart with music by Brian Duncan and Kareem Imes. 